Hi there. We got a lot of spy photos for House of the Dragon when it was filming in Cornwall this past week. And one of the big things we saw was we finally saw them filming major scenes at that big army camp set that they were constructing at Kynan's Cove. That the week before filming, they were really building up this large military encampment. It was too big to hide. And we knew this was going to be something. And based on the geography, that it's this rocky coastline, beautiful rocky coastline, we said, this must be the Stepstones for the war in the Stepstones, this proxy war between the Valarians, aided by Daemon Targaryen, and an alliance of the Free Cities. This is the lead up to the Dance of the Dragons, the decades before it. Well, we just got spy photos from this past week of filming, clearly showing it's a Valarian army camp. We thought maybe it's an army camp of Free Cities mercenaries. No, it's a Valarian army camp. And we saw a lot of people in this, dozens of Valarian soldiers. It's a really large scale. That's what impressed me the most. But on top of that, we got really good high-resolution photos to the point that we could see Matt Smith as Daemon Targaryen walking around in it and holding a war council with Corlys Valarian and their other commanders. They're holding this war council around a map table. And you can clearly see in one of these shots that Daemon is reading a letter he got and reacting to it and explaining it to the War Council. In the spy photos, you can see, apart from Daemon, you can see Corlys and two other dark-skinned, blonde-haired Valarians from the TV version of the Valarians. I'm saying family members, not soldiers. Obviously, all these are Valarian infantry who work for them, much as the Starks and Lannisters had infantry who were, uh, they're Starks. Well, they're Stark soldiers. They're not Stark family members. But no, these are ethnically what they've established as the look for the Valarians in this show. One of them is Corlys. Another one is probably his son, Lenor, based on his hair. Outside chance it's someone else that we're pretty sure that this is young Lenor based on the length of his hair, outside chance that it's older Lenor, we can't really tell because it's fuzzy. It's possible Lenor isn't in this scene and it's some other cousin, but no, I'm 99% sure this is Lenor. But it's a question of, is it the younger one or the older one? What this does sort of tell us, and it's not a huge revelation, is that there will be overlap that during the time period that we see young Lenor and young Rhaenyra, played by Millie Alcock, we will see Matt Smith playing adult Daemon. We think they've also cast a young Daemon, but he's older than them, so young Daemon would be a teenager when they're small children. So I said in my preceding video, uh, Fionn O'Shea has probably been cast as young Daemon. I think he's been cast just for the Great Council at Harrenhal, which I think we will see on screen. But, you know, by the time that young Rhaenyra marries Lainor and is courting him, that's ten years later, we'd see we'd shift to Matt Smith with makeup and haircut in such a way that he's supposed to be relatively young. But like how they did it on The Crown to show the passage of time, they didn't always recast someone. Like, he would cover a 10-15 year range of that character just with makeup, haircut, and clothes in a different way to show, okay, time is progressing. So there might be some overlap period where we see Matt Smith with young Rhaenyra and young Lenor, you know, makeup-wise to look a little younger. Then he'll shift to what we saw in the promo pics, where, okay, he's fully adult Daemon now, opposite adult Rhaenyra. Well, I talked about this in another video, that there is a 16-year age gap between Daemon and Rhaenyra in the books, but that's because she's a really young teenager. Like the Daenerys situation, they would have to age her up. So the age gap between them is probably going to be the age gap between Matt Smith and Emma Darcy, which is closer to 10 years, that Matt Smith is about 38 now, and Emma Darcy, they're about 28 so more like 10 than, than 16, but I, I don't have a problem with this. This isn't really a huge revelation. If just to bridge the gap, the very last few young Lenor and young Rhaenyra scenes would shift to having a young Matt Smith 
in, in youthful makeup just to show these are the same characters. I, I don't really take issue with that. What I'm more interested in is just seeing this really cool army camp and just how much stuff they put into it. Uh, you may have seen this going around. There is spy footage of this army camp, but it's really redundant with the spy photos because it's a dialogue scene. It's not an action scene. It, it, I, it's not worth my YouTube channel getting into copyright trouble that they care more about when we post footage than when we post photos. But it's footage of Damon reading a letter and then talking about it to the other people. And it's not like someone stands up and punches someone or anything. It's just them reading it. You can't really discern anything from it, so it wasn't worth splicing it in. Hi there. This is me from the end of the video, spliced in. As I was making this video, which took a while because it's splicing in a lot of spy photos, as I was making it, a better version of the spy footage came out. That the first 10 second clip I saw was just him reading a letter, then I saw the full version, which was from this 8 minute video that HBO has taken down from YouTube. Like I said, they care when we post footage. But I saw it and it's been going around in clips on Twitter. The full version of this scene is, I'll put screenshots here at least, I'll describe it. Yes, Davon actually punches someone. I wasn't referring to that, I was being sarcastic, it just turned out that way. In part because Damon does punch messengers in the books, and this seems to be based on a book scene, so that's what I was thinking of, and it turns out that's what they did. So, with screenshots, what happens is the director is yelling, shouting at everyone, okay, for eyeline, look at that spy drone, that's supposed to be Damon's dragon, Caraxes, coming in for a landing. You know, it's CGI, so it's not there, but... The idea of the scene is that Daemon flies to the camp on Caraxes, which, of course, he brought his dragon to the campaign in the Stepstones. Then Matt Smith steps into frame, having dismounted from Caraxes, who isn't there. So he walks into frame in full Targaryen armor, uh, with a helmet on, but then he takes his helmet off. It's good to have helmets. They took a lot of the helmets out in Game of Thrones, even though Martin's really upset about that. The people wear helmets in, in war. So Daemon arrives at the War Council, and they're having dialogue for a while. There's dialogue stuff around the table that we can't see. Then a troop of Targaryen infantry arrive. That they're wearing the standard Targaryen infantry, which is it's red. It's not like the Valarian infantry. You can tell they're a group of messengers. The lead one walks up to the table and hands Damon a sealed letter. He opens it, walks back to the table, and reads it aloud to the rest of, of the assembled lords. He then calmly hands it back to the messenger and looks back to the table facing everyone else. Then, without facing the messenger again, he backhands him using his helmet. That he had his metal helmet on the table that without looking at him in this all he flies into a fury and this all happens within a second and we have footage of it he backhands the man in the head with his metal helmet and because he wasn't expecting it he didn't brace for it so he just crumples to his knees and then at a fraction of a second that daemon follows through he swings backhand then he swings forward hand that when the guy is dropped to his knees he then cl uh, clocks him in the head again with his helmet from the other direction so it's bam, one, bam, two, and he knocks him to the ground. And step three, he then kicks him in the head. So it's knocked to the knees, knocked to the ground, then kicks him in the head. And by that point, because this is all within a second, the other, the Valarians around the table scramble to pull Daemon off of him. And then he calmly walks away and just nonchalantly tosses the helmet away. Things like this do happen in the books. What happened was Daemon's older brother is King Viserys, and his first wife, Rhaenyra's mother, died in the year 106 after conquest. And it was considered scandalous that Viserys chose to remarry within the same year to Alicent Hightower, young Alicent Hightower, this young mage, he's a gold digger, and she's the most beautiful woman in the realm, and just like half a year later. Daemon was upset because 
up until that point, he was still the male heir to the Iron Throne. There was some debate about this because some people didn't like Daemon and said, uh, uh, let's make Rhaenyra the heir ahead of you, which is the law of Westeros, that a lord's daughter should succeed ahead of his younger brother. But there were some debating this, that ironically the High Towers who hate Daemon at the time they argued for Rhaenyra because they didn't want him to be king. So for a while, at least, Daemon was, okay, I'm heir to the throne ahead of Rhaenyra, even though there's some debate on that. The fact that Viserys remarried so quickly meant before long he's going to produce a male heir, knocking Daemon down the line of succession. He thought maybe he won't even remarry. So according to the books, quote, in the veil, when he got the news of the remarriage, in the veil, Prince Daemon reportedly whipped the serving man who brought the news to him within an inch of his life. Nor was the sea snake pleased. House Valarian had been passed over once again. His daughter Lena scorned, just as his son Lenor had been scorned by the great council of Harrenhal, and his wife by the old king back in the year 92. Now later, of course, they go, okay, well, to heal the rift with the Valarians, let's marry Viserys' daughter to Corlys's son. Lenor, that we passed over Lenor to be king, we passed over that Viserys could marry Corlys's daughter, why not have Viserys's daughter marry Corlys's son to heal the rift? That's why Rhaenyra and Lenor are in a loveless arranged marriage. But the big thing is, it, th this is an incident in the books where Daemon beats down a messenger within an inch of his life when he's told that his brother has remarried very quickly, that before long he's going to start having sons again. He had a son who died in the cradle a matter of hours after his wife died giving birth to him, which set all this in motion. So the question here is, in the books, Daemon is reacting to this in the veil, not in the stepstones. And in the very next paragraph, it says, Daemon and Corlys did not even go to the wedding. They decided to start carving out territory for themselves in the stepstones. So this wedding was in part what spurred them to go to the Stepstones in the first place. Now we see them already in the Stepstones. So I think one of two things is happening. Either A, they just shifted this to the Stepstones and Corliss was going to go anyway because they were having problems with, with shipping tolls with the Triarchy and the Free Cities. Or they've recycled this basic idea that he's reacting to a messenger that Aegon II was born just a year after Alicent married Viserys, in the year 107 Aegon was born, by which point they were already in the Stepstones. So it's possible that Daemon is reacting to the news that Aegon II has been born. Uh, here, my lord, your brother the king just had his firstborn son. Congratulations! And Daemon turns to the council and goes, I'm not the heir to the throne anymore, the, the, the male heir, and then starts beating down the messenger. It's possible he's reacting to the birth of Aegon II. A third possibility related to this is maybe this is going to be a running gag, that he's going to beat up a messenger more than once. That at a previous point from this, he beat up a messenger in the Vale when he heard that his brother was getting married, and what we're seeing now is a second time that they didn't condense it, they made a second version of it. Now he's reacting to the birth of Aegon II violently. So we'll see on that. Like I said, I can't load footage of this, and it's about a 30 second clip I made. I posted this to Twitter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to load it to YouTube with a parody soundtrack, because sometimes they let you get away with stuff if you go... It's transformative. It's a work of parody. Therefore, it's fair use. They're probably going to take it down anyway. But I'm showing you the screenshots anyway. And even when you do see it, I mean, it's stage punches. You can tell Matt Smith isn't really hitting him. They're going to speed it up and use camera work to make it look like he's really punching this guy out. It's a stunt, man. They're going through the motions of it. It's still fun to watch and use your imagination a bit. But we got this really good spy footage, and I don't know how they did this. They, it wasn't a spy drone, it was someone from the landward side. They just had a really good camera zoomed in, 
and you can see this moment from the books changed slightly of Daemon beating the messenger when he gets bad news. I like not this news. So, continue from this point, I'm splicing in the rest of this video, which is talking about what can we see about the Valarians themselves in this army camp and their costumes, and what does this say about the overall story for the war and the Stepstones. What is interesting to me, though, all the other stuff about the age range stuff, looking at everything, it's pretty, but in terms of story elements, the one thing I am kind of interested in here is the third Valarian family member. That if that's Corliss and we're 99% sure that's Lanor, either young or adult Lanor, who is this third dark skinned, white haired man? And again, it's not Valarian soldiers. Would it just be another minor Valarian cousin? Because at the big funeral scene they filmed at the Driftmark set in Cornwall back in May, we saw like three or four black men with white hair, Valyrian bloodline wigs. And we remarked on it at the time, okay, these are clearly two different distinct actors, there's at least three or four of them. But there's a difference between a crowd shot at a funeral and you're showing this is the whole extended family from their home castle, even children are there, and a war camp where there's only three people around a, a war council table like that, four if you include Daemon, but this person is prominent enough that he's the only black-skinned, white-haired man in the whole crowd apart from Corliss and Lenor. Is this just another what we thought were background people at the funeral scene? Is this a speaking role? Because visually he seems to be pretty prominent. There's only four people around the table, including him. What I'm building up to is wondering if this is one of the younger Valarian cousins who comes into the storyline, specifically Vaymond Valarian, or one of the Silent Five, possibly condensing them together, possibly not. That, due to the accusations that Lenor's sons with Rhaenyra were not really his, but bastards fathered by Harwin Strong, if you read the Rogue Prince novella, it came to a head some years after Lenor and Lena's funeral that Corliss got really sick at one point, but he got better. But while he was almost on his deathbed for a bit, things came to a head and the younger Valarian cousins confronted the king. Lenor's children are bastards. I should be the heir to Driftmark, not them. And they fought Daemon over this. The lead one was Vaemon. The younger cousins were the Silent Five because he ripped out their tongues. Now, obviously, Lenor is still alive at this point in time. That this would happen after the war in the Stepstones. Lenor died after that. But the question is, could this third Valarian-looking guy be Vaemon Valarian, and they're bothering to set him up in advance? Because in the book, you know, the, the book is, you know, it's a short. Uh, novella, he's just racing it off and had to be edited for, for length to fit in a book. Vaymond isn't mentioned in the war because it's just an outline. It says Corliss fought a war in the Stepstones in like a paragraph, and there must have been a lot going on. But then at the very end, Vaymond is introduced and dies on the page he, he, he appears in. So, could the TV show be doing the smarter thing of Let's not just have Valarian minor cousins pop up as needed. Let's bother introducing them a few episodes before they become relevant to the plot. Which is a good idea. So, the speculation is, is this Vaemon Valarian and they're setting up a confrontation between him and Daemon? Or is this just a spear carrier? You know, is this just a guy who might not even have speaking lines coded as a minor Valarian cousin based on his appearance, but he might just be yet another guy standing around the war council table. You know, like on Game of Thrones, you remember when like Tywin would have a war council around a map with a do literally a dozen people in the room, but only three of them talk. You know, like it would be Tywin or Jaime or Tyrion or, or Uncle Kevin. That <laughs> realistically at a war council, yeah, I understand this is the limits of a TV show, a war council scene needs to last two to three minutes, not actually that long, versus in a book where you can have ten full pages of a dozen characters debating what to do. 
you have to cut out the minor Lannister commanders like the Marbrands and, and stuff. I understand that. So is he like one of those placeholder minor Lannister and Stark lords that don't really talk during the map scenes? Or is he Vaymond? I, I hope they build it up like that, because we saw a lot of people in the, in the funeral scene that they're, they're showing that this is a big extended family with multiple branches. We'll see how they play that. I can only speculate on what the heck is in the letter that Daemon gets. It might just be a dispatch from his scouts. I think it's probably a dispatch from his scouts because they're looking at a war map. It wouldn't be like a political thing. I mean, it could be some news from King's Landing, but it, it's probably just... So far at this point, we think it's just, hey, the scouts send this message, that kind of thing as they're looking at a map. And shifting camera angles, we have an even better look at this map. These things were taken with spy drones. These are really good images. This is so close. We can see the map marker pieces. We can see the toy ships that they're moving around on the map they have. I mean, not really close-up detail, but this is a spy photo, and I can clearly see what they're holding. I'd love to see the real detailed full ones. I mean, you know, when it comes to Game of Thrones merchandise, that I don't, like, buy replica swords for $500. I get those little, to I get those little toy map markers that are replicas of Rob Stark's map, because they're fun. You, you move them around a map and stuff. Use them as a decoration or I have Risk Westeros edition, and we play, and my friends, when we play around with those, they're fun. It's, the map markers are more interesting to me than like this really expensive sword or something. So I look forward to having the toy of these map markers, and they're fun. But at this better angle, you can really see them moving ships around that they're clearly discussing military maneuvers in the Stepstones. Uh, something like, ah, now the Free City's army is over here. But we're on the south side of Bloodstone Island, so our fleet will attack from here while Daemon circles around and hits them from behind with his dragon, getting them in a pincer's movement, you know, th that sort of thing. And this is great stuff, just remember back in the early seasons of Game of Thrones, when locations on maps were actually important, like they are in the books, when they took themselves seriously? Like, season one they had a good map scene where Rob's army camp is explaining, here we are in the Riverlands. And I, it's simplified from the books, but it's, okay, we're sending a feint east towards Tywin, and they're doing it slowly to make sure the audience gets it. But this is a feint. Our main force will go west to hit Jamie's army at River Run. And it was simple, but it, it made sense. The last few seasons, they didn't want to draw attention to logistics and plot like that, so they wouldn't have map scenes, or the few times they did, it was really embarrassing. It's one of the top clips on my channel is when I intercut, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. In, in the video clip I posted that, I intercut the map scene from earlier within the same episode, where Varys is pointing at a map and showing the and says in dialogue, the Iron Fleet is around King's Landing and Dragonstone in Blackwater Bay. And then Danny kind of forgot about this. It's the same damn episode. For some reason, the dragons zipping to the wall in season seven makes me more angry than that, because that's just this is Danny being stupid because of the writers versus this defies physics and the fact that people were still hyped for season eight, even after the stupid white hunt stuff at the end of season seven, that you've established that dragons aren't that fast and just how petty and insulting the directors were like Alan Taylor. And you could tell they were under pressure for this. They went, Oh yeah, it's a fantasy world with a fantasy lizard. And we're like, Ignoring the dragon, you have established that the Raven Network takes a couple of days to get from the Wall to King's Landing or, or Blackwater Bay and Dragonstone. Multiple elements of this are faster than you have ever established. That the Raven Network isn't that fast. Gendry can't run that fast. How far? And it's the dragons zipping to the Wall. Everyone was upset about that, and they were flippant about it. Oh yeah, maybe you could make a better show. Yes, the one that George R. R. Martin wanted to make. Let's hire some real writers. You're not real professional people. There are other. It's oh, I want to do it. No, 
I am not a professional uh, TV writer. You passed over all those people at like Austin Film Fest, the room full of writers they were bragging to were con men who got this ahead of all of you. That I wanted people who actually take this seriously and aren't just flippant about, oh yeah, the travel times don't matter. And it wasn't just that, that was a big example of it, but any point where the actual plot mechanics of, wait a minute, how did Jamie's army suddenly get to High Garden in the middle of the Reach with no one noticing when most of the Reach is apparently still on the Tyrell side? Little things that if you actually look at this on a map, it's gibberish. And in fact, the few times they, like I said, the few times they actually showed stuff on a map, it was really embarrassing. Like the White Hunt itself, they were stupid enough to start that episode in case you're a TV only fan. They started the episode with this long panning shot of the map table at Dragonstone. So you can see that, yes, Dragonstone to the wall is half a continent. Like, why were you stupid enough to remind the audience of that in case they didn't know that in a visual format because they didn't read the books? Or didn't have a map on hand after this being a really popular show for six years already? But looking at this map scene, I know it's not much, it's just islands in the Stepstones. There's a dozen islands, you don't even know the names of all of them. I'm... Deep down in my heart, I'm hoping for how good the map scenes were in the first four seasons where they were explaining we are fainting towards the the Ruby Ford, but we're really going to go west and hit River Run. Or, okay, here's the Starks in the north, here's the Lannisters in the middle, but here's the Baratheons in the south, and here's what Stannis' army is doing, and this is what his, his ships are doing. Or like in the books, maneuvers and the politics of that actually matter. That I, I'm pouring all my hopes into this, that this will actually be them focusing on, oh, look, this is how long travel time takes. What would be amazing is if they even have a line of dialogue where Daemon says, oh, Caraxes can't get there that fast. It'll take at least an hour to get to the other side of the islands. Just something establishing that there is a logistical limit and internal rules to... It's an army camp, and we're debating, do we have the resources to launch an attack on Island A or Island B? So I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to have, it's like, it's, it's up there with talking intrigue while walking through a beautiful garden. I love that trope. The other trope of, we're talking about army maneuvers on Game of Thrones while at a war council pushing pieces around a war map. <laughs> I live for that shit, so I'm really looking forward to this. But the two big reasons I'm making this video to show these spy photos are, first and foremost, it's follow-up to last week when this was the first big thing we saw them building again in Cornwall, this army camp, confirming that, yes, it is for the war in the Stepstones, it's actually the Valarian army camp. And on top of that, showing you this is what it looks like fully completed when it's staffed with all the extras, there's dozens of extras of this, it's a really big set. And by extension, just the sheer scale of this completed thing, realizing what we can glean from it is they're investing a lot of attention to that subplot. That this is this whole realized Valarian army camp, coupled with the large scale of other stuff we've seen, like the crab feeding scene, where they had all those pirates, dozens of pirates, staked to the beach at low tide to torture them to death that the, the scale of this, like I said in the other video, this combined with the crab feeding scene, the war for the Stepstones will not be just some minor footnote that they mention in passing leading up to the Dance of the Dragons. This is going to be the main focus of season one, or the main action focus. There's going to be intrigue at court, but because the Dance of the Dragons won't happen this season, that they're building up to that. It's, it's a 30-year build-up to it. This is the main action storyline for Season 1. It will have dragons in it, not fighting each other, but, you know, dragons fighting ships and things, Caraxes tearing up the Stepstones. This war for the Stepstones will be the main showpiece for all the eye candy. And as many channels have said, we don't want to rush to get to the Dance of the Dragons. We want you to do proper setup for it, because... We don't want you to just burn through material to run off to do Star Wars movies. We want you to tell the story right. Well, that was the first thing, just 
showing the sheer scale of this completed army camp, yes, this will be a major storyline. Second takeaway is costumes. Just looking at design stuff, just leaving this for last. That some of these other spy photos, we got different shots, are th these are things people must have taken who were around on set. Really close, high-resolution shots of Valarian soldier costumes. Uh, th this is something the HBO itself could have put out. They're so good. Well, when I say soldiers, it's there's regular infantry look that you'd have for, like, guardsmen around a castle, and then there's the costume for full knights. You know, even on Game of Thrones, not everyone wore full plate armor because it's expensive, and on top of that, even a knight wouldn't wear it all the time, that you'd see uh, Jamie Lannister or Tywin, when they were in battle, they would actively, in the middle of a battle, they would wear heavy plate armor. But when they were walking around their own army camp, which is still a war zone, there might be archers or something, but you don't want to wear your armor all the time, they'd switch to just a breastplate. And this is also different from finery that they would wear to a ball or a wedding at the royal court or something. So this isn't all of their designs, just like standard infantry foot soldier design and standard background knight design for the Balarians. Really good shot. I mean, particularly of this plate armor here. Wow. And you can see the design elements they put into it, that it's supposed to look a little like a seahorse, but not overdoing it. Just, it looks a little bit like the underbelly of a fish. There's a little bit of scaling. It's not over the top. It's more of the suggestion of that than overdoing it too much. So I like the balance they struck here. Also good looks at their helmets. Now mixed in with this, we do see Daemon himself in full armor at the War Council scene. It's not a good look at his armor, though, because it's from a distance and it's a little blurry. That he has a fully armored look, and I'm bringing this up because here's even more spy photos, which are close up, where he's just wearing a breastplate and he's wandering around through a battle scene. And some people say, oh, this looks nothing like the artwork of what Daemon looks like in full Targaryen armor, and other people point it out, that's because he's not wearing full armor. That he, he stripped down to just a breastplate to survey the land. But we can see in the other shot, you see them next to each other, this isn't his full armored look. This is like when Rob would just wear a breastplate or Jamie would just wear a breastplate because he's in his army camp. So there'll be different levels and stages of the armor. So he took off his outer armor in these shots and doesn't really show anything. It's not elaborate. It's not supposed to be. He will wear more elaborate armor, which we've seen blurry in the background of other shots. I look forward to checking out the design for what does Targaryen knight armor look like in this. We've seen what infantry armor looks like. And the one last thing that we saw, which is, I'm pointing it out because it's in really good detail. We saw this utterly high quality spy drone photo of an unfurled, even Valarian war banner that we got our most high quality look ever at this is what TV Valarian heraldry looks like. And we've seen this on costumes before. We've seen a few banners of this in the background. This is the best banner shot we've officially ever had. We are using it on the wiki now because it's clear there's nothing on top of it. I think this was probably meant to be a, a promo shot or something for when they have, you know, the guy at the edge of the camp holding their, their flag and then they put it out in promo shots. Of course, as I said, this isn't the real Valarian sigil. It's supposed to be a seahorse, a real seahorse. Then again, we're starting to see weird heraldry stuff, which I will get into next week when they're filming in Surrey. Because there's rumors that there's this big tournament scene they're filming, which will show us a lot of heraldry. Tournaments have a lot of heraldry. When you think about it, we don't even know if the Stark and Lannister heraldry will be the same in this show. I mean, maybe they will intentionally change it because it's a different time period. We'll have to see how they play around with that, but there's a very good shot of the TV Valarian heraldry. But the big takeaway from this whole video was just, yes, the war for the Stepstones is going to feature prominently in Season 1. It is going to be a large-scale thing with lots of stuntmen in fight scenes and battle scenes on the beach on ships. It's not just going to be a footnote. They're building entire army camps and all these wrecked ships that men are fighting in and uh, along the coast and dozens of pirates staked at low tide to feed the crabs. This is, this is really getting me excited. It's getting a lot of other people excited too who are also reporting on this because it's not just, oh yeah, 
here's a tent. We're finally getting spy photos of substance that are cool things from the prequel novella that we really want to see. You know, action stuff. But it makes sense this would be the main action focus of season one, because it's, it's the big war thing of the otherwise peaceful reign of Daemon's older brother, Viserys. So like I said, I'm going to report on all the other spy photos. This is a series of catch-up videos, and we got a lot of spy photos. Also, there's some other characters, individual characters, that we saw in this, like a Kingsguard design or from other houses intermixed with the Valarians. But I'm going to split those off into separate smaller videos to give them more focus. Right now, this is for looking at the scale of this and a really good look at Valarian costumes and some of who is that third man that Daemon is with at the War Council and what are they doing and what might be in the letter. Tell me what you guys think might be happening in the comments here and stick around for the next report video.